So I'd like to say thank you and welcome for coming to iMotions, what are emotions and how we measure them. Uh, I just wanna point out, we have some free guides on our website if you want more uh, further readings. And we also have a uh, certification for human behavior called iMotions Academy. Uh, your two speakers today will be Dr. Brennan Murray. He's our VP of Client Enablement Services and Jessica Wilson. Uh, also a doctor in, neuro, uh, in neuroscience, senior product specialist at iMotions. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Great, thank you so much, Olivia. And thank all of you so much for being here to attend the webinar today. Um, as Olivia mentioned, we are going to be discussing what are emotions and how do we measure them? Uh, <clears throat> just some quick background on myself and my co-presenter, Dr. Jessica Wilson. Uh, I am the Vice President of Enablement Services at iMotions. Uh, my background is I have a PhD in Cognitive Psychology uh, and I've been working in the Behavioral Science Research space for about 16 years at this point. Uh, Jessica, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, my name is Jessica Wilson, and I'm a senior product specialist here at iMotions. Uh, my background is in neuroscience and physiology. So a lifetime ago, I did research on sleep and Parkinson's disease, and since then have had the opportunity to help deploy these technologies um, with iMotions clients all over the world. So I'm very excited to be here today and to partner up with Brendan on this super cool topic. Wonderful. So as we jump in, uh, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, back several years ago when I was still an academic, uh, my research specialization was in understanding the interaction between human emotion and how it influenced uh, memory, uh, so that specific set of cognitive processes. We all uh, on this webinar probably have our own conception of <clears throat> what emotion is uh, or what we mean by the word emotion. For many of us, that probably calls to mind imagery, imagery of things like romantic comedies, uh, taking care of loved ones. As emotion researchers, we use uh, simultaneously both a much more specific and a much more broad definition of emotion at the same time uh, when we use that word. So the first thing that is helpful to understand is this concept that emotion is really everywhere around us. It's not just specific to some of those examples that I mentioned up front. For example, when we are interacting with another person, whether that is face-to-face, uh, -face, whether it's virtually as we're doing right now, we take in and we process a lot of information all at once. One of the things that we process very quickly and virtually automatically is an individual's facial expression. This is an evolutionary response that we have as a collectivist species that rely on one another for our survival and well-being. It's very important that we can quickly take a look at someone's face, try to make some kind of judgment about what they're thinking and feeling so that we can use that information to navigate our social interactions with them. And this is not just something that we do with humans. Uh, as many of you are probably aware, we tend to detect faces everywhere. And we also assign emotional value or emotional responses to those faces. It's very common that we'll take a look at our pet or we'll be uh, encountering animals somewhere. And we might think something to ourselves like, oh, look at the cute, happy puppy. Or we see a car and we think to ourselves, oh, that car looks really angry. Or even if we're having engaging in a digital communication with somebody and they're sending us emoji, we start automatically and very, uh, very quickly and robustly assigning emotional value to those emoji that they send us. Uh, interpretations of things like, wow, they seem really surprised by whatever it is that I just said. And this is not just specific and unique to faces. We also do this uh, automatically with even very low level stimuli. So back in the day when I used to uh, teach college courses on emotion neuroscience, one of the examples that I would like to do, which Dr. Wilson, I'll ask you to be my guinea pig on this, uh, is to show folks a short video, like the one that I'm about to show. This is called the Heider Simmel uh, illusion. And what, uh, what we'll do is I'm just gonna play a short clip of the video. And Jessica, if you wouldn't mind just kind of narrating what it seems to you like is actually happening in this video, please. Okay. So the red guy is trying to exit the box. Uh, it's trapped though. Um, the blue guy and the pink guy, it looks like they're trying to help him get out. And blue guy is a lot more frantic about it. He's like moving around really quickly. Might be antagonizing the red guy. Looks like they might be fighting and pink is hiding away. 
All right. So in the interest of time, I'll stop you there. That was that was great. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Uh, so you can do this uh, with really any number of different people and you'll get lots of different stories about what these uh, different characters are doing, what their motivations are, uh, what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, some folks will think that the blue triangle and the pink circle are bullying the red triangle or the red triangle is being aggressive to them and they're trying to escape. And you come up with these very rich uh, emotional stories which at the end of the day make absolutely no sense whatsoever because these are literally three amorphous shapes just moving around on a screen. It's two triangles in a circle. They do not have any motivation. They don't have any intent. There are no goals that they're trying to accomplish. And yet this is a very, very natural process for us to start coming up with these stories to try to assign emotional value to what we're seeing. And as I mentioned before, when we talked about faces, this is an evolutionary response. Our emotions can do things like help us rapidly detect threats. If we're out hiking and suddenly a snake pops out of nowhere, we have a very quick emotional response to that as part of our self-preservation instinct. Uh, we'll likely leave immediately, um, maybe even more immediately, depending on how afraid of snakes we are. And we do this with varying degrees of sensitivity. So those of you who may uh, be more fearful or more aversive to snakes, uh, we'll look at this image and probably be able to spot the snake very quickly. Whereas others of you may have just noticed the leaves. You might've thought that that, was a, that that was a branch or part of the foliage. And sometimes we do this a bit too sensitively. Uh, so if there, are any, uh, if there are any folks who are watching, and I apologize in advance if you're very snake averse, um, but you might quickly look at this image and think that that piece of straw in the middle is also a snake. Um, so sometimes we can do this a bit too sensitively. Our emotions are the way that we assign labels of good and bad uh, to things in our world. Uh, we try a piece of cake and that cake makes us feel good and we like the way that it tastes. And so now we are motivated to have more of that cake both now and in the future. Conversely, there might be a piece of stinky cheese that we have an aversive reaction to and we feel like it's bad and we're going to avoid it and we're not gonna wanna eat foods that maybe uh, contain that type of cheese. But we can also change our labels of good and bad over time uh, based on the experiences that we have in our lives. So maybe over time we actually acquire a taste for that stinky cheese and then we start actively seeking it out and cooking with it. So all of this is to say that uh, when we talk about emotion, again, we're not talking about those sort of very specific uh, stereotypical uh, cases of emotion that I mentioned up front, things like the romantic comedies. We're talking about a much more ubiquitous part of our daily life that helps guide uh, our behavior in the moment, helps guide our behavior in the future, and helps us navigate the world that we're in. So what exactly are emotions? Um, I've talked about what those emotions can do for us so far, but we haven't quite yet defined what emotions are. And if there's one thing that you take away from the information in the webinar today, this is the piece of information that I, I believe is the most important which is that emotions are our, way, our brain's way of tagging information as being relevant. We are constantly bombarded by stimuli in our environment. We need to in some way filter out a lot of that information that's not immediately important to us and have a way to kind of grab onto the things that are important for our survival, for our reward, for things that are goal oriented in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, and our emotions and our emotional responses are brain's way of making that relevance tag so that we know that there's something important to pay attention to. And as a very simplified schematic of what this looks like, you can imagine that there's some stimulus that we encounter. Uh, let's say again that it's the snake while we're hiking. We have an emotional response in the moment. Uh, for many of us, if we see a snake while we're hiking, that's going to be a fear response uh, and we're going to be looking to remove ourselves from that situation quickly. And so in the moment, our behavior is likely going to change based on our emotions, but all of this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Our brain then actually stores that information so that it can help inform our future behavior and our future decision-making. We're going to avoid that hiking trail in the future, for example, so that we can avoid the snakes. But also the next time we go hiking somewhere else, we're likely to be more vigilant uh, for things like snakes or other threats while we're out hiking. So it's this feedback loop of having a response to something in the moment, using that information to guide how we're going to act in the moment, and then storing that information about that response so that we can update or influence our future behavior. 
And these emotional responses that we have are measurable. Uh, this is these are not uh, this is not just a nebulous uh, amorphous term that doesn't really mean anything or refers to some concept that we can't put a finger on. We can measure the responses that individuals are having in the moment to various things in their environment. Many theories of emotion uh, that are generally accepted uh, tend to operationalize emotion in two dimensions. The first being uh, emotional arousal or the intensity of the response that we're having. Uh, you can imagine that depending on your degree of fearfulness for snakes, if you see a snake, you may have a very strong response to that or a very low level response. Uh, or if you're somebody who has a strong affinity for snakes, you can have a very intense response that is very positive as opposed to negative. And that's the second dimension of emotion that we typically think about, uh, emotional valence or the positivity or negativity that's associated with the state that we're in. And these Brendan, two dimensions I, up. Oh, yeah, please, Jessica. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I have a question that uh, actually a lot of people have been asking. What is the difference between emotions and feelings? Because I think there's a lot of overlap between those uh, those concepts, but they are still a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about emotions or emotional responses, we are typically talking about something that is right in a specific moment. It's the response or reaction that we have to a stimulus to a person to something that's in our environment uh, they tend to be very rapid they tend to be very fleeting and again really serving that evolutionary purpose of helping us make a decision about what we're going to do right now uh, things like feelings or mood tend to be spread out uh, over a longer period of time so you can think about watching a television show uh, you're watching your favorite comedy and that might put you in a good mood and a good state of feeling for the half hour that you're watching the episode. But throughout that episode, there are going to be specific moments that are particularly engaging or funny to you. Uh, those jokes that really happen to land with you. Those will be the moments that you're having these emotional responses. So easiest way to think about the difference is that emotions tend to be a rapid in the moment response to something, whereas feelings, mood, uh, uh, other uh, uh, other similar terms to that, those tend to be more kind of states that we're in over a longer period of time. Thank you. Absolutely. So these two dimensions of emotion, uh, intensity and positivity and negativity, are, are generally thought of to operate relatively independently of one another. I gave the example of a snake before, where if you're someone who's very fearful of snakes, if you see one, you will have a high intensity response, which is also negative. If you're someone who has a strong affinity for snakes, uh, you may have a relatively high intensity, but a positive response. And we can take those two combination or the combination of those two dimensions of emotion, and we can think about them in this sort of uh, two by two display. Uh, this is in uh, emotion literature referred to as the affective circumplex, um, first introduced by Jim Russell. Uh, in the 1980s, with the idea being that any of these responses that we have contain some degree of intensity and some degree of positivity and negativity. And then by being able to understand those two dimensions, we can start to categorize different experiences, different things that we encounter as making us feel excited or sad or depressed or anxious or have uh, having an aversive response. And now, as an over, Brendan oh yes, please. I have a quick question about the circumplex model. Um, I know this is a very popular way to conceptualize emotion, um, but is that sort of the, the de facto way that we can think about emotion or are there other models in the literature um, out there right now? It's a really great question and I'll try not to take us down too much of a rabbit hole here. Uh, so this is one of the prevailing and most popular theories of emotion, um, but it is one of several theories of emotion that exist. Um, this uh, circumplex model is uh, part of what is called psychological constructionism, which is the idea that uh, emotional responses that we have are constructed from these combinations of intensity and positivity, negativity. Uh, things like excitement or happiness or distress or anxiety, uh, those are not discrete sorts of states or feelings or uh, responses that we have, but rather those are just kind of convenient verbal labels that we assign to how we're feeling based on the intensity and the positivity of the response that we're having. Uh, the One of the other very popular theories of emotion is what's called basic emotion theory, 
And basic emotion theory does ascribe to the idea that emotions are discrete units, uh, that something like anger, for example, uh, has a discrete and preset and automatic set of processes that trigger in the brain to give rise to anger. In other words, in basic emotion theory, those basic emotions, anger, sadness, happiness, those are the smallest building blocks of how we feel at a particular moment in time. Whereas with uh, the circumplex model or psychological construction, uh, the idea is that those emotions of something like anger are not the smallest building blocks, but that the smaller building blocks are these dimensions of intensity and positivity, negativity. This is a debate that's been existing in emotion research literature for uh, literally decades at this point, uh, and there still continues to be disagreement over whether emotions are very discrete uh, and sort of innate and prepackaged, or if they are something that arise from these combinations of uh, intensity, intensity and positivity. Uh, much of the research that that uh, that I've done, uh, both in my academic career and in practice uh, in business consulting, uh, have led me to have much more affinity for the circumplex model. Uh, to give an example of anger, again, if we think of anger as just a discrete unit that kind of happens, for me that doesn't really fit very well with the fact that uh, from one person to the next. Anger can feel very different to two different people. Or even within ourselves, my feeling of anger in one instance can be very different from my feeling of anger in a different instance. Uh, if someone cuts me off on the highway, that feels very different from if I stub my toe when I'm walking around at night, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I think, I, I think it's such a good point to make that there are different models and ways to think about emotion out there because often when people who don't specialize in neuroscience or, or emotion or psychology, want to sort of adapt these concepts to their practice, it's very easy to fall into a trap of like, oh, okay, well, this is what it is according to science. And science by nature, there's always going to be a measure of uncertainty. There's always going to be people arguing about the best way to think about things. So I think for everyone who wants to utilize these concepts within their own applications and industries, you know, be a little bit uncomfortable with that ambiguity and be comfortable you know, with the fact that people are still trying to figure this out. And that's in a way good for you because you know, that ensures that what you're working with is sort of the most modern, up-to-date, cutting edge sort of ideas out there that people are still trying to figure this out. Um, so I think it's a, a really good point to make. Thank you, Brendan. Absolutely, excellent point. So and I so do just, have actually- Oh, please. <laughs> I do actually have one other question. Um, and this pertains more to your, to your next slide. Uh, someone asked, is it possible to have multiple emotions at once? Um, and is there a way to have like a specific emotion that might eliminate another emotion? So basically, if you're thinking about those conceptual building blocks, how might they interact with together? Absolutely, it's a really good question. And I, I will pull up the next slide for that uh, because what I do on this slide is I do show some very simplified but discrete examples of uh, times that may make us feel specific emotions. Um, the question of whether or not we can feel two different emotions at once uh, is actually a very loaded question and also one that's still open um, for folks who are familiar with the term ambivalence uh, that really if you break that word down means ambivalence you're feeling multiple things at once or having multiple emotions at once where there is discrepancy or disagreement is the degree to which those emotions coexist with one another at the exact same time versus uh, having a state where we're actually rapidly switching back and forth between two different feelings. Uh, if we think about, for folks who are familiar with blackjack, for example, a casino card game where uh, all of the players at the table are playing against the house or the dealer, but each individual person's actions can influence whether other players at the table with them win or lose. And you can find yourself in a situation where it's right for you to make a certain play uh, in the game of blackjack that is best for you to maximize your winnings, but that actually comes at the expense of others. This is a great example of a time where you might feel mixed emotions or ambivalent or multiple different emotions at once, where you're happy for yourself that you're winning, uh, but you may also feel some feelings of guilt or sadness for, for others around you. And it, it's, it, it's not a currently settled question as to the degree to which those things overlap with one another versus your, if you were 
able to really get in tune with yourself at the millisecond level is it that you're just going back and forth between multiple states very, very rapidly. So certainly there are times where we can feel mixed emotions or feel ambivalence. Um, the, the examples that are on this slide are, are much simpler and more discreet than that, but it's certainly something that's, that's possible. We can have multiple responses to something. It's just a question of the timing of when those responses happen. So perfect, thank you. Absolutely. We, we've talked to this point about what some of the evolutionary utility of emotion is. Why do we have emotional responses to things? It's essentially to help guide our survival and allow us to navigate our world. We've talked about how we can potentially break down uh, what emotion means into these discrete axes of intensity and positivity and negativity. But it's also important to understand that we can actually measure these things too. Again, these are not nebulous concepts. Uh, these are things that we have the tools at our disposal to be able to measure in the moment, what is the response that someone is having to whatever it is they're encountering or they're presented with. Something like galvanic skin response, for example, uh, is a great measure of the intensity of an emotional response that someone's having at a given moment in time. Uh, galvanic skin response, for those who aren't familiar, uh, is a measure of the electrical conductivity on the surface of the skin. When we encounter something in our environment that our brain tags as being relevant, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in, uh, in the brain and in our body. One of the things that happens is that we slightly increase the amount of sweat that's on the surface of our skin. That changes the electrical properties of our skin, and you can measure that very easily with uh, essentially a simple circuit to understand when somebody had a response and how intense that response was. If we wanna measure uh, the positivity or negativity of the response that someone's having at a given moment in time, there are many tools that can do this. Uh, facial expressions can have quite a bit of utility here for understanding is somebody smiling at a given moment in time? Are they making an angry face? Are they frowning? Are they looking disgusted? It doesn't give us perfect, complete information about what they're actually feeling. It just tells us what they're displaying on their face. But again, we talked about the social utility of facial expressions, and that can give us important information about what someone is feeling or the response that they're having in the moment. And of course, many measures of traditional self-report can help us get at that, uh, that dimension of positivity and negativity. Asking people, how much did you like X? Uh, how likely would you be to do A, B, or C again in the future? So these are measurable dimensions of emotion, and that becomes very important because once we can measure the emotional responses that people are having to things, we can actually use that to improve our research, to be able to understand and answer the questions that we're looking to answer. Now, I think it's worth pointing out here um, that these are the most common tools for measuring valence and intensity, but there are many circumstances or use cases. Um, it, it depends a lot on context, both on the stimuli that you're using and also the physical setup. So for example, um, you know, we do a lot of work with virtual reality and it's very hard to get facial expressions when there's a giant headset in the way. Um, so maybe, Brendan, can you talk a little bit as to sort of the different use cases and how the tools you might use might differ in those circumstances? Yeah, absolutely. So something like facial expressivity, for example, as you would expect, you need full view of someone's face to know what facial expression they're currently displaying at the time. Uh, in a case like a uh, virtual reality headset, as you mentioned, Jessica, most of your uh, most of a respondent's face or a person's face is going to be obscured by that headset, and so facial expression analysis may not work uh, may not work uh, in those cases. This can be a place where you could leverage asking questions via something like self-report. Depending on the question that you're trying to answer, you may also be able to use someone's behavior, uh, how they're acting or engaging with the virtual environment that, uh, that they're currently immersed in to be able to understand how good or bad they're feeling in a particular moment. Um, if they're going through uh, an, an exercise like a reward-based game, for example, are they gravitating more and more towards certain actions or certain parts of that game where they're experiencing increasing reward? Uh, that's something that we know is tied very closely to people's subjective feelings of how good or bad something was, is whether or not they felt rewarded. In other circumstances, if you want to understand something like a cognitive behavioral approach versus avoidance motivation, it's not a pure valence or positive negative measure, but that may be the dimension that you care the most about. Are people more motivated to approach or avoid something that you're showing to them? In which case, using EEG 
in a controlled lab-based environment may also be an appropriate measure to try to get at that uh, at that uh, axis of positivity negativity. So a lot of it, as uh, Jessica, you mentioned, really comes down to both your your research and you're trying to answer, and just having a good understanding of what would make sense for that horizontal axis. Is it good versus bad? Is it purchase intent is it uh, approach versus avoidance and building your research program uh, around that rather than trying to retrofit something uh, retrofit something into these sorts of presupposed measures. Thank you for that. Um, there is uh, one question that, um, that has been asked quite often. So you talk about using biosensor approaches with self-report um, because in a way they do complement each other, but you might have circumstances where the biometrics are telling you something different from what they're saying in the survey. How do you reconcile those sorts of discrepancies? Uh, those are my favorite results to see because I think that those are the most interesting, uh, even though they can be the most work to try to interpret. So a couple of things to keep in mind, uh, and we'll cover this in, in a few slides from now, uh, this sort of perceived discrepancy between uh, biosensor and self-reported research um, and why it's not truly a discrepancy. But keep in mind first that you're measuring people at different points in time. Uh, any type of biosensor research, you're capturing responses from someone in the moment when they're having an experience. Whereas measures of self-report, even if you're stopping people during an experience and asking them questions, that's still after the fact, after they had had an experience. And so at that point, they may not remember all of the things that they felt like they had a reaction to. Uh, they may minimize in their minds the importance of some of the things that they really liked or disliked. Um, they may be biased based on the way that you're phrasing the question or the fact that it's a person asking them a question. Self-report after the fact can still give you exceedingly important information about what people remember from their experience and what the takeaway was. I usually describe this in two different ways. The first being that uh, biosensor or neuroscience research can do a really good job of answering what and how questions. So what do people respond to? How intense are the responses that they're having, et cetera? Whereas many self-report methodologies are good at answering why questions. Why do people feel like they uh, preferred video A over video B? Why do people think they would be more likely to purchase product A versus product B? And I usually break that down into thinking that uh, the biosensor or neuroscience results are a good indicator of what that specific person and people like them uh, are likely to do or behave for themselves. And self-report can be a really good indicator of advocacy in the future. So if people remember something and they share feelings with you through self-reported methodologies, they're more likely to then take that information back to loved ones, friends, acquaintances, et cetera. So when we see those, again, perceived discrepancies between biosensor uh, results and self-reported results, that gives you important information on the time course of the experience that someone had. How did they respond in the moment through the biosensor research? And then what information did they retain from that experience that they had, which you're capturing through self-reported methods? I think that's such an important distinction to make, uh, especially as people become more interested in these tools. Uh, another common trap to get into is to think that this is going to be the end-all be-all for explaining everything, where, whereas for each tool, there's definite restrictions um, to how you can think about and interpret you know, the results that come from that, right? So I think you know, really developing that holistic view and using those multiple sensors you know, really gives you that nice complementary approach to account for you know, all of these different restrictions with like timeline and physiology versus the way we think about and want to communicate about things. So I think this is a really great way to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that leads nicely into the next section that we wanted to talk about in the webinar, which is what can we actually do with emotion measurement? Um, and exactly to your point, Jessica, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of research, particularly commercial-based uh, neuroscience or biosensor research that I see, presupposes uh, this syllogism that I have on the screen here, which is that people encounter something uh, and there's a set of biologically-based processes or emotional responses that they have to that, as we've discussed before. We have the tools to measure those emotional responses. And if we can measure their emotional responses, then we can predict their future behavior. 
um, that tends to be the end goal for a lot of folks is how do I predict what people are going to do in the future? The challenge with this line of thinking is that it doesn't take into account the fact that Yes, we do have emotional responses to many different things in the moment, and those things will guide our future behaviors we talked about. But there's also a whole bunch of other stuff that influences the way that we're going to act at any given moment in time. Uh, the context that we're in, the people that we're with, uh, time of day, what we had for breakfast, um, and whether we've got an upset stomach from it or not. There are all of these different factors that we can't really measure. Um, and if we tried to, we would just be completely overfitting our research. Um, or we would just have no way to, to possibly measure. So there are so many other things besides our in-the-moment responses that can influence our behavior that this is not the correct way uh, in most cases to think about the types of research that you're doing. It's not about measuring people to predict what they're going to do in the future. Instead, the model that I prefer kind of flips that around a little bit and is a bit more backward looking. So taking observed behavior, we know that for whatever our research practices, that there is some way that people behave in the world. And what we are trying to do is explain as best we can why they behaved the way that they did. What is it that was driving their behavior? And I typically think of this uh, from the frame of mind of, uh, there's a lot of variability in how people act. So, uh, if we think about product purchases, some people are gonna buy a specific product, other people are not going to buy that product at all. Of the people that buy that product, maybe they're going to buy a lot of it this week and none of it for the next three weeks. Maybe there are going to be some people that are going to buy it every single day. There's a lot of variability in whatever the behavior is that we care about. And what we are trying to do is explain as much of that variability as possible to understand why people are behaving the way that they do. And where this becomes really important to Jessica's point from both a research design and interpretation standpoint is that no tool is meant to be a perfect measure of understanding why people act the way that they do. Instead, we're just trying to take out chunks of uh, explanatory power so that we can get the best understanding possible of how people act. So let's take a product example. Um, maybe uh, I work for a company that is launching a new product and I wanna know how it's being received by people. Well, some of the questions that I might, uh, I might expect my consumers to be asking themselves when they see this new product is, did it motivate me to act in some way? Uh, do I see this product and it's I'm feeling motivated to approach it or to get it or to get more of it? Did it connect with me on an emotional level? Uh, did it elicit that relevance response that we talked about before? Is it memorable? Um, is it something, again, as I, said, uh, as I said before, that I'm likely to remember later that maybe I'll advocate for to others about? And even did I notice whatever the product is to begin with? Um, perception is hugely important because if we don't actually perceive whatever the thing is that's being measured, we're not going to have a response to it. Uh, that's the way that perception works. Uh, did it make me smile? And then of course there are, to Jessica's point before, there are always going to be a whole host of unexplained factors that we can't control for, that we can never hope to measure all of them, which are also going to drive the way that people, pe that people behave and act. And the reason that I highlight uh, these specific questions is that these are ones that we have tools to measure. Uh, something like electroencephalography, as I mentioned before, uh, under the right lab-based circumstances can give you a really good indication of cognitive behavioral motivation to approach or avoid something. Galvanic skin response, which we've talked about several times, is a great measure of emotional relevance or if something connected with me on an emotional level. Self-report, great measure of memorability and, and other things. Uh, if we want to know if people notice something, eye tracking is a, great, uh, is a great place to go to. If we want to know if somebody was smiling or frowning, using facial expression analysis. And then, of course, there, as I've said, there's always going to be some chunk of people's behavior that is just driven by things that we'll just never hope to be able to measure. Brendan, I, I really love this slide just because, you know, breaking it down into how each of these different tools can account for the variance uh, within our behaviors. I, I think, you know, one of the trends that I'm seeing a lot uh, in different industries is this interest in emotion AI. This is, of course, coined by our, our partners at Effectiva, who've been really been a driving force in this area. Um, but, you know, this concept where people are trying to use machine learning to create predictive models of emotion. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to your experience there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so 
to take it at its, at its most base level, I, I think the underlying question is whether or not that's possible, right? Is it possible to, uh, from these measures of emotion, be able to create uh, machine learning or AI models that can then uh, do a good job of predicting how people would respond to X, Y, or Z? And I think the short answer to that is yes, certainly. These are, these are measurable responses that people have and it becomes a question of scope and scale of data and what you're trying to answer. Uh, to be able to train a machine learning model on, uh, on an emotion or understanding human emotion, you need tons and tons of data from many different examples of many different people in many different environments. And that can be as broad or as constrained as you want, depending on what you're interested in. If you want to know uh, the degree to which people uh, feel really good when they wake up in the morning, if they've got a certain color of light in their room versus uh, a, a different color of light in their room, that's something that over time you could collect enough data from enough people. If you had enough access to those participants, uh, if you had the tools to be able to do that measurement and start to build a model of, okay, here's how people will most likely respond to different colors within that one specific environment. If you wanna broaden that out to something like, how do people respond to color in general? That's a much, much more broad uh, research question that, again, is not impossible, but would be very, very difficult to be able to get enough instances uh, um, uh, of those emotional responses from people to be able to train a reliable machine learning model. So certainly something that's possible uh, as the ubiquity of self-measurement uh, continues to increase in consumer devices that people uh, that people own, this will become easier and easier to gather those large data sets. Um, but right now it's something that, you know, Affectiva, for example, has the scope and the scale to do for what, for what, uh, for the things that they're interested in. Um, but it's hard to do without a lot of access to a lot of data. Yeah, I think I'm really excited to see where this sort of field goes because, I mean, we're seeing it in the market research space, we're seeing it in the automotive space, definitely in the academic space, there's so many different applications, healthcare for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, like Brendan said, there's some caveats about, you know, what kind of data are you going to be looking for? What are your specific metrics? I think that's so important, like really refine what your variables are and then, you know, find some way to find your ground truth to really validate those. But yeah, I think this is a super cool application uh, and Affective has been driving a lot of that. It'll be cool to see where this goes. Absolutely. So to, to move on a bit, just being mindful of, of the time that we have here, uh, one of the questions that came up earlier was trying to understand this uh, perceived discrepancy between in the moment measures that you would get from neuroscience or biosensors uh, relative to what people can say after the fact from an experience. And typically this is operationalized as uh, some folks call it the can't say, won't say challenge, which is that if you ask people questions, there are lots of thoughts and feelings and responses that they can verbalize, that they're willing to tell you in the moment. And then there are also thoughts, feelings, beliefs, et cetera, that, they, uh, that they're not willing or able to verbalize for you. Um, they may withhold information when you're asking them questions about a product because they might think that their answer or their feelings are taboo in some way, or they don't want to hurt your feelings, or they minimize their own opinion, the kind of, oh, I'm not going to share that because it's probably stupid and nobody else feels that way sort of phenomenon. Um, so there are things that people can tell you, and then there are things that they are either unwilling or unable to tell you because they have thoughts and feelings that they're unaware of. And then there are also biases that people have, uh, which are sort of a base level uh, set of feelings or beliefs that people hold about any number of different things that will in small and large ways drive their behavior. When we think about this, uh, these two dimensions of measuring people in the moment through neuroscience or biosensors uh, and measuring them after the fact through some sort of self-reported measure, what we're really talking about is uh, what's discussed in cognitive science as a dual process theory. Dual process theory uh, is a, a, in, it, in its most simple form, this idea that uh, if information comes in, we encounter something, we see an advertisement, we see an image, uh, that, that information that we take in can go through one path in our brain, or it can go through another path, and those paths may or may not be separate and distinct from one another, but both of them 
can influence the behavior that we take after the fact. And one of the most probably popular and, and well-known uh, 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 references to dual process theory is this idea of type one versus type two thinking. Um, for the folks who are familiar, uh, type one thinking or cognition is uh, often thought of or called things like automatic and effortless and emotional and fast. And type two is discussed as being more controlled or effortful. Uh, it's slow, it's more non-emotional um, or more sort of cognitive in nature. Uh, more popularly, these have been referred to over the past uh, eight or 10 years or so as system one versus system two thinking. System one being that intuitive uh, system and system two being the more rational, uh, rational or reasoned system. Uh, we'd had a quick poll uh, that was in the webinar for how many people are familiar with Dan Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, and I was also curious to know how many folks uh, who are familiar uh, with the book have actually read it. So if you can just take a second first and just answer, have you heard of Thinking Fast and Slow by Dan Kahneman? And we'll give a few seconds on that. All right, so it looks like we've got an almost even two thirds split. So two thirds of the folks are familiar with Thinking Fast and Slow uh, and about a third of the attendees uh, are saying, nope, they're not familiar with it. For those of you who, uh, who answer that yes you're familiar with it um how many of you have actually uh have actually read the book thinking fast and slow we'll give a few seconds uh, on that one as well so if you've heard of it have you actually read this book all right and we're seeing uh <clears throat> about the same so about two-thirds of folks have have said that they have actually read thinking fast and slow and about a third are, are saying that they haven't at this point so the reason that I ask that question is because I, I, when I do these presentations, I like to make a couple of what seem at first to be relatively um, controversial statements, uh, given the popularity of the system one versus system two distinction. The first being that system one and system two are fictitious characters. These are not systems that actually exist uh, within the brain. The second being that they're not even systems at all, um, that they're not entities that have interacting aspects or parts to them. And the really important one, there's no part of your brain that is the system one part of your brain. There's no part of your brain that's the system two part of your brain. Um, and so this system one versus system two is actually a really meaningless distinction. And the reason that I say that uh, that I say that these statements might sound controversial is Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist and behavioral scientist, uh, and I myself am not. Um, but these are not my thoughts or opinions. These are actually things that Dan Kahneman himself says at the very beginning of the book uh, on one of the first pages. These are the statements that he makes is, look, these are not actually systems that exist. Uh, I'm writing a book here. I'm trying to get across a complex cognitive principle. Um, I need to have characters for my book, but this is not actually how the brain works. The reason I like to bring this up is that this tends to gl get glossed over quite frequently when people are thinking about how they approach the research. Uh, I see this very frequently, um, even today, where folks are concerned about whether or not their research is geared at measuring system one versus system two. And the challenge with that is that it's a relatively meaningless distinction about whether you're measuring system one or system two because those systems don't exist. It's all kind of one flow of cognitive process. And so the model that I tend to try to push people more towards to update their thinking and change the way that they're potentially designing their research is more of a process flow. So starting with context, which I mentioned earlier, context is very important for understanding how people are going to respond and behave to any number of stimuli. Um, uh, this is, context is frequently self-selected by people. We decide what situations to put ourselves in. <laughs> and then once we know what the context is that people are in, uh, we wanna measure perception. So whatever it is that we care about measuring people's responses to, we first need to know, did they actually perceive it? Um, did they see it? Did they hear whatever it is that we're, that we're interested in measuring? After that perception occurs, then there is a process uh, which is referred to as cognitive appraisal. This is pretty rapid and automatic. It's a cascade of implicit, explicit, automatic responses, seeing the snake while you're out hiking and having that 
either fear-based response or, again, if you're someone who really likes snakes, maybe you're excited to, th to see the snake. But all that happens very, very quickly to help inform and guide how we're going to act right in that moment. And then the last step is one that's relatively uniquely human, which is emotion regulation or self-regulation. Uh, we are not totally beholden to whatever that initial appraisal response is that we have. Uh, we can update that response. We can amplify it in situations that call for it, uh, or we can suppress it or reframe it and actually change the way that we're thinking about the situation that we're in. And I like this process flow because it highlights the fact that all of these steps feed back into one another. Um, so the appraisal that we have of something, that in the moment emotional response, that automatic response that happens when we encounter something, can actually influence our perception. If we have an emotional response to something, we're actually more likely to see more of that in our environment over a short period of time afterwards. Our appraisal can also influence our context. If we start to learn over time that one particular hiking trail is not a great hiking trail for us, we'll start to update the context that we're self-selecting for ourselves. And that in turn is then going to affect what we perceive in our new environment, how we're responding to those things in our new environment. And our regulation can also affect all of these steps. Our emotion regulation or self-regulation can influence the future appraisal responses that we have, our regulation can influence our perception, and it can also have an influence on the context that we put ourselves in. And the reason that I like this is because it nicely packages how we can measure each of these different steps to get the best understanding of human behavior. So context, we can measure through observed behavior, just seeing what people are doing and where they're going. Perception can be measured through something like eye tracking, for example, if we're interested in visual or physical things to know if people notice them or not. Those appraisal responses, we can measure through galvanic skin response, electroencephalography, facial expressions, et cetera. And all of those tools can also be used to measure those self-regulation processes, but this is also an important step where self-report comes in as well, because our self-regulation is going to heavily influence what we have to say about an experience, about an object, whatever else after we encounter it. So I'm gonna wrap up quickly just with a very short case example of what emotion measurement looks like in practice. Uh, so this is a case example that uh, I've presented on several times over the years uh, from a study that uh, iMotions had done in conjunction with Activision Blizzard Media, uh, where the approach that was taken by Activision was more of this process flow of emotion model that, that I discussed. Uh, Activision, for those who aren't familiar, is a major global uh, gaming company. And the specific team that we were working with wanted to understand advertising within mobile games and specifically what is the impact of tying some kind of reward to an advertising experience while people are playing a mobile game. So for example, you're playing Candy Crush, uh, you encounter an ad in the middle of your Candy Crush experience. How is it different if you are actually given a reward for watching that ad? Something like you get to skip a level, you get an extra life. Uh, versus an experience in another game or in social media or on some other digital platform where there's no inherent reward that's tied to watching the advertisement. Uh, so Activision's hypothesis, is, as you would expect, was that reward-based advertising would be more likely to get attention and reduce ad aversion um, from users um, and might be less likely to detract from just the overall emotional experience of playing the game. Uh, they tested folks on a variety of different platforms, um, some with reward-based uh, gaming ads and other platforms where there was no reward that was tied to the advertising. Um, and what they found was that first, if we think about perception, those premium or reward-based ads were viewed for longer than non-reward-based ads. Um, and we know that uh, all of us are pretty advertising averse. So to be able to create an environment where people are more likely to watch ads for more than twice as long when there's some reward that's tied to them versus not is really impactful and powerful. In terms of the emotional response to both the ads themselves and to the platform that people were experiencing the ads on, what we saw was that individuals who received reward-based advertising uh, were more likely to, in the moment, experience uh, positive and more intense um, uh, emotions than folks who were not receiving reward-based ads. And also the experience of the platform itself 
So physically playing the game, physically using the social media feed, that was also more emotionally evocative for folks when the ads had some kind of inherent reward tied to them. And then in terms of self-regulation, what you might expect is that uh, because people are watching ads for longer, they may after the fact perceive that ad experience as having been more intrusive because after all, they've spent a greater percentage of their experience time watching advertising than people who didn't get reward-based ads. Uh, but we actually saw the opposite after the fact where people said when we were asked how intrusive was the ad experience, if they received reward-based ads, uh, they were uh, much less likely to indicate that they felt that the ads were intrusive relative to the folks who did not re receive reward-based ads. And this was really, really impactful for uh, Activision's uh, ad strategy because you have created an environment where people are having a more enjoyable experience, they're watching advertising for longer, and their perception after the fact is that the ad experience was less intrusive for them uh, when there was some kind of reward tied to that advertisement. So I'll wrap up here with just a quick little plug. Uh, obviously, uh, we who are presenting today, uh, we all work at iMotions, which is a software company that provides a software platform to allow you to be able to take the different types of measures that we've talked about today. Um, we have a quick poll that's up right now about uh, ways in which uh, you would like for us to get in contact with you if you're interested in learning more about how you can utilize the iMotion software platform to either bring biosensors into the research that you're thinking about doing, uh, if there are opportunities to consider other biosensors besides ones or in addition to ones that you may currently be using. And then we also have a suite of uh, support services. Um, we're resellers of the hardware um, to be able to get you doing the best research that you possibly can. So thank all of you so much for your time. I really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, and Olivia, I'll turn it back over to you to wrap us up a bit. Okay, I'll just give a couple more seconds for people to vote. Um, thank you guys for attending. Just so you know, we do have handouts. Uh, if you look on the right corner of your screen, there's a little paper icon. There's some handouts for you to download. And of course, uh, we have free uh, guides on our website, imotions.com slash guides, uh, where there's other um, biosensor data and also research and also how to write grants, for example, if you uh, for the academics out there. A lot of great um, free resources uh, in our knowledge library. Great, we're getting a lot of votes in. Thank you very much. I'm gonna close the poll soon. And we're gonna be taking just one or two more questions and whatever questions we don't get to, please feel free to email us at marketing at imotions.com. There are actually a ton of questions, which is very exciting. Yeah, um, let me lead off with the, one of this. Uh, is negative emotion weighted heavier than positive emotion during an analysis of a task? Hmm. Brendan, I think you're muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Um, it's a really great question, and uh, Jessica, please feel free to jump in on this one as well. Um, it, we talked at the beginning of the presentation about how emotions really are born out of an evolutionary purpose, right? Um, <clears throat> these have developed over the course of human history to help keep us alive um, at, at the most base level. Uh, negative emotions or having a negative emotional response to something does a lot of things very differently from having a positive response. Um, if we think about the, the need to act or the immediacy to, to act, depends of course on the task and the context, but generally there's more immediacy to act if we're feeling negative emotions relative to positive emotions. That also does depend on the intensity of the emotion that's being experienced. We also know that in general, uh, negative emotional responses tend to have differing effects on our perception, cognition, and memory. So if there's something negative that's in our environment, you may be familiar with the weapon focus effect. Uh, we tend to focus on whatever the negative thing is at the expense of information around it or in the periphery. Whereas positive information, um, probably a, a less well-known term than weapon focus effect, but with positive emotions, you might hear the term broaden and build meaning that when we're experiencing something as being positive, 
we tend to sort of uh, open our cognition a little bit more to the other things that are in the environment. And again, both of those you can think of from an evolutionary perspective. If there's a threat in our environment, it's really critical that we devote our cognitive resources to focusing on that thing so that we can preserve ourselves and our survival. Whereas if there's something that's positive in our environment, we wanna take in as much information as possible about it uh, and about the environment and the context so that we can later seek out similar rewards later. Um, so that also kind of speaks to the immediacy that I mentioned before as well. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, someone would like uh, you to explain about primary and secondary cross-cultural emotion. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we know that for uh, for many types of emotion measurement, whether it's using neuroscience and biosensors, whether it's using self-report, that there are cultural differences in terms of the responses that people have and what it is that they're responding to. The way that I usually think about it is that uh, something like galvanic skin response, for example, is universal. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, it doesn't matter culture, it doesn't matter uh, biological sex, uh, any of those factors that you can think of, if somebody has an elevated galvanic skin response, that indicates that there is something that is relevant that their brain is identifying for them. Where cultural differences or other group differences come in is in terms of what it is that people have that response to. That can differ greatly across cultures, across age, uh, across sex, uh, any of those individual difference factors that you can think of. Um, so the responses themselves generally mean the same things regardless of who the people are, uh, but it's what you're having that response to that can vary quite a bit depending on what the groups are that you're looking at. Great, I hope uh, that was all the questions we could answer. Of course, we're still available at marketing at imotions.com if you have any further questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, everybody stay safe. Uh, well wishes from Copenhagen, Boston, and Chicago. Bye everyone. Thanks Thank for you, everybody. Everyone.